Um, obviously, HESIM is one of the most like impressive packages that's out there for health technology assessment. So we really appreciate you having us talk, talking to us today. Uh, so I think our next presentation is Irina. So Irina, you're already a co-host. So we'll let you take away a guide to the Tidyverse style. Thank you. Right, okay, so hopefully you see my slides. Um, okay, so um, thank you everyone. Um, so my name is Irina Shlakov. Um, I am based at the Health Economics Research Center at the University of Oxford. Um, I've been, um, um, I'm interested in developing models for chronic diseases and I've been using R for quite a number of years. Um, I actually still remember the times when the forums, the R forums were not just quite as friendly as they are now. Um, and today, um, as um, Howard said, I'm going to talk about a Tidyverse style guide. Um, so as many of you would know, Tidyverse is a collection of R packages with a shared philosophy and grammar, which is designed for data manipulation and data visualization. And all these packages are written within a common style guide, which was derived from Google's original R style guide, which in turn is now based on the current Tidyverse style guide with some modifications. Um, and what I'm going to present today is just some extracts from the style guide. I'm not going to talk about all of it, uh, partly uh, not because I disagree with some of its parts, uh, but that because uh, covering all of it uh, would just be quite time consuming and boring. So what I'm going to concentrate on um, is on the internal structure of the R files, uh, but not other topics. It's actually quite extensive. So it covers topics like documentation, um, internal, um, not internal, uh, file and folder structures and so on. Um, and I should say that unlike everybody else today, um, I'm not presenting any of my work. Everything I say is based on Hadley Wickham's uh, Tidyverse style guide document, uh, which is publicly available online. So what is a style guide and why should you care? Well, a style guide is an opinionated set of rules and best practices. Um, it covers obvious things such as how to name a variable or function, how to do commenting, but actually it's normally quite comprehensive. Um, it may also cover things like how to produce documentation, how to, have, um, how to write commit messages, how to perform, which unit tests to perform, and so on. It is opinionated. Some rules would genuinely make your code easier to read. Uh, many other rules, however, would be arbitrary. Its purpose is twofold. On the one hand, it, if, a, if a code is adhering to a, to a style guide consistently, it would be easier to read, to debug, and it would be easier to share it with other people so that they can reuse and adapt it for their purposes. On the other hand, it also makes it easier to write the code, even if you are the only person who are working on the project. And this is because you don't have to make any decisions uh, on how to name variables and so on, because all decisions would have been made for you so all you need to do just to follow the instructions. Um, and so consequently, that saves you quite a lot of time. So strictly speaking, you don't need a style guide. However, having one would make everybody's lives a bit easier. So let's see what the Tidyverse people, what rules have they come up with. Um, so let's start with object names. Uh, so the object names in Tidyverse are adhering to the snake case format. So what it means, it means that you only use lower cases, uh, lowercase letters, numbers, and underscores. And you separate words with underscores. Okay, so you don't um, separate words with capital letters, which some other styles do, nor with dots. Um, you use nouns for variable names and verbs for function names. Um, you try to come up with meaningful and concise names. So for example, instead of saying, instead of calling the variable first day of the month, uh, possibly something like day one would be just as suitable. Um, although these names are um, surprisingly hard to come up with. Um, and it's a good idea to avoid reusing names of common functions and variables. So if you have, uh, if you have a function that calculates mean, it's probably not a good idea to call it a sum. Okay, controversial topic, uh, spacing. Um, so you put a space after comma, not before. Um, so just like you would in, um, in normal English. If you use parentheses, you don't put spaces inside. 
um, if you use parentheses um, um, statements together with an operator E for a while, you put a space in between. Okay, so you put a space here. Um, and if you have, um, if you use your parentheses and it is, it is followed by a subsequent code block or a function argument, you put a space in between as well. You use spaces, uh, you surround uh, most operators by spaces. So for example, plus or minus or the assignment um, operator. Um, and there will be exceptions to this rule. Um, exceptions are actually quite obvious. So if you have operators with high precedence, um, such as a dollar sign or a colon or bang bang operators or help operators, this, this do not require space. Um, and this is probably easier to illustrate with an example. So if you have something like, so if you have a formula, um, something like this. Uh, so the only thing you have to um, surround the spaces here is the assignment operator and the multiplication sign. Everything else um, uh, does not need a space. Okay, so it's quite intuitive. You probably have lots of uh, code blocks um, in your code. Uh, so the rules are that the, uh, so you, all, your code blocks will be uh, um, put in curly braces. So the opening curly brace should be the last character on the line. And the line should also contain the related code. Uh, for example, the if clause uh, that came just before the curly brace. And once you finish your code block, the closing curly brace uh, should be the first character on the line. Um, Hadley is the spaces person, so the contents inside the code block would be indented by two spaces, not a tab. Um, and if you have a very simple statement, one line statement, you can actually you don't actually have to put it in um, in braces. You could just put everything in one line, um, like here, for example. Uh, the exception is function calls uh, that affect the flow. Um, so, for example, return statements. Um, I'll mention them on the next slide as well. Um, so, if you have something um, that affects the flow, that it goes into its own um, code block, its, um, its own braces set as well. Um, to write functions, um, so I've mentioned use verbs for function names. So, for example, instead of model generations, you say generate model. Um, when you write arguments for function, if you override default argument values, um, then you should use full. Okay. Um, so use full names when overriding default argument values, um, uh, but you omit names in, of an argument, which is some sort of, which is a data argument, which is um, often um, used and as a standard argument. So as an illustration, if you use a mean function, um, then the first argument is the x argument, which is um, just a common data argument. It's a vector of which you want to find the mean. So you don't actually specify x equals two. Uh, but then when you override the, um, op um, the, uh, the default version of um, the default um, option um, of the, um, sorry, the default value of the optional argument ni.rm, um, then you actually specify this is what you're overriding. Okay. Um, next statement is, um, I put it here because I've tried to be sort of objective. Um, I'm not quite sure what I think about it. So you only use return statement for early returns. Otherwise, you rely on R to return last evaluated expression. So what it means, um, if so I have a function here, app2, um, and if I have an early return, so if I want to return a value in the middle of the code, so say in this case, if my first argument is equal to two, I return X, then I do put, then obviously I have to put a return statement. However, if I don't, and my return value happens to be the last value in, in, the, um, in the function, then actually I don't put a return statement. Um, and as I've mentioned, return statements should always be on their own online and um, in the braces in their own code block. Okay, uh, pipes. Uh, pipes are all, always surrounded by space, followed by a new line. Okay, um, if you have just one step pipe, you can write it in one line, it doesn't need a second line, um, or you can just rewrite it as a normal uh, function argument. Um, again, after the first step, everything that follows should be indented by two spaces, like you have here. Um, and if you have a function that doesn't have an argument, 
technically you don't need to put the round brackets here, but actually that's not a good idea. So the, the advice is actually to put brackets even if they're not required. Okay, um, and if you use ggplot2, it's exactly the same logic. Uh, so when you put your layers, which are separated, not the pipes, but the classes, um, it's exactly the same logic that applies. Um, if you have a long line, um, so you do the indentation in the same way. So if you have a long function definitions, you intend the second line um, to where the definition starts. If you have a couple of short arguments, uh, they can go on the same line and on the first line uh, where the definition starts. If you have a long function call, you use one line for function name, uh, one line each for each argument, um, and one line for the closing bra uh, bracket. Okay, um, a couple of more points uh, which I thought were interesting. So don't put multiple commands, uh, I don't use semicolons. Uh, use the standard assignment operator, not the equal sign for assignments. Start comments with a hash and a space, single space. Um, an interesting comment I found, which I thought it's worth thinking about, if you need comments to explain what your code is doing, consider rewriting your code to be clearer. Um, use double quotation marks for quoting text. Load all packages at the start, um, rather than if and when you need it throughout the code. Um, and one thing, um, you should, um, those of you who use RStudio, you would have noticed that actually RStudio automatically incorporates some of these um, indentation rules. Um, so for the last two slides, I just wanted to um, um, mention two packages, um, sort of styling packages that may help to, um, you to sort of write your code in a, um, in a tidy style guide. Um, so first is the styler package. So styler package provides non-invasive pretty printing of R code, um, which adheres to the tidyverse formatting rules. Uh, pretty printing is not my terminology, by the way. Um, you can actually customize it to format um, code according to other style guides. Um, you have different styling options um, and you can actually control the level of invasiveness. So which, what, what sort of messages you'd like to see. Um, so in the interest of time, I don't have a live code demo, but you just see um, a couple of screenshots. Um, so uh, you install and then load the library styler, you put your ugly code, um, and then you run the style text command, um, and this is what you get. Um, it actually can be color coded as well. Um, so it basically suggests you how you can rewrite your code uh, so that it adheres to certain, to certain rules. Okay, so it puts spacings, uh, breaks lines, and so on. And then that second one, second package is lint R. Um, so lint is a, um, um, a coding formatter. It's not actually unique to R. This is just implementation in R. Um, so again, it checks adherence to a given style and syntax errors, and it's integrated in RStudio. So what I've done, um, I've, um, I've run the lint. Um, um, I, I, I linted my, the file I've used for, the, um, uh, for this presentation. Um, so I went to addings. Um, and uh, once you've installed this package, you'll see uh, different lint options. So one of the options is lint current file. So I run it um, and it gave me, uh, it basically picked up the lines uh, which I wrote as bad code examples. And it also picked up some typos in my um, good code examples. Um, so for example, you see it says line 103, commas should always have a space after. Um, and this was my example uh, on spacing, or line 105. Do not place spaces around code in parentheses or square brackets. She's here. Okay, um, so that's all I wanted to say. As I said, this is just a part of a style guide. Please do refer to the original, um, sort of to, to, to the main document um, for, for all the other um, 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 rules they have. And thank you very much. Thank you very that's much, Irina. I think you must have had some fun writing this talk because <laughs> Whatever made it's kind of liberating, right? Because you're making up rules that people need to follow and then eventually they become like God given and you know, the tidyverse guidelines say so, so it must be the right way to do it. Yeah, although I must say, as I said, I don't necessarily agree with all of them actually. Some, some of them, I, yeah, I kind of, yeah, uh, caused me some um, raised um, eyebrows when I was reading them, but I thought I'd be sort of objective and present all of them here. Yeah. So one question that came up is whether you know uh, what the rationale is behind the sort of not using the return command um, at the end of the of the function. 
Yeah, that is a very good question. I don't actually know. I mean, that's one of the things you do when you write uh, slides based on somebody else's um, 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 ideas. You can just, you know, you can direct your questions directly at um, Hadley Wickham. I am actually, that's one of the rules. I'm not sure I agree. So I'm just looking at the chart, uh, at the chart to see the person who's asked this question also always use return. I always re use return as well because I think it's good practice. It makes sure that you always know what is returned rather than something may possibly go wrong in R. So I don't actually have an opinion um, on that, but perhaps somebody, somebody would know what's the, uh, what's the rationale for not using return. Well, 150 people on the chat, no one is piping up to defend uh, leaving out return. <laughs> I think if I understand correctly, it's just a matter of, um, well, it's, it's economic use of, um, of the code essentially, because at the end of the function, R will return whatever you're, you're typing there. So there's no need technically. Whether you put it or not is probably just a matter of preference. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that, yeah, style guides are not a given. It's just some set of rules that's made up um, and it's made up just to make everybody's life easier. Yeah, it's not, it doesn't necessarily make it correct. Yeah, it's like using underscore versus capitalization. I don't think either is correct. It's just as long as you use consistently. And then if you can see the chat, there's a, there's a final question, I think. What if the first argument of the next function is not taking the intended object that is piped through the previous function? And there's an example as well. Um, I'm not sure I understand the first argument of the next function. I mean, one of the things it says there that I mean, that's fine though. I mean, why, why, uh, that's, why you have to that... name the arguments, I guess. So if I understand yeah. correctly, that means that you, you're expecting to apply whatever you, you get out of the piping as the second input to that function bar. That is actually, that is actually one of the points in the style guide that actually, if you use, you mean, if you, for example, wanted to merge in half, halfway through your pipe. Um, so actually that's one of the things in style guide, that's not a good idea. So if you want to somehow uh, sort of use it on two different data sets, it's better to do one pipe on the first data set than do another pipe on the second data set and then combine this. Uh, so sort of set, um, introduce intermediate variables and then as a next step, you merge them or whatever you want to do with them. And then from there on, you do the pipe on the data set you've just created, if it makes sense. So basically use the pipe precisely so that the previous output is exactly the input to the next output. And if it's not the case, then you should rewrite the code so that it is, so that you do two separate um, manipulations first, and then you put them together in the command. And then on this command, you apply the piping. Okay. Thanks very much, Irina. I think, I think we should probably take a break now uh, before coming back to our next presentation, which will be the by Mi Jung Kung from University of Oxford. So we'll come back in 10 minutes at quarter to four. Thanks very much, everyone. Perfect. Quarter two. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Only five minutes behind, so I don't think that's doing too badly and not too huge attrition of participants over time. I think we're doing really well. And thanks everybody for sticking up. I know it's obviously doing things in the normal way would be a lot a lot more fun and a lot easier for everybody. And uh, we'd have had lots of interaction in, in the breaks and stuff, but I guess this is how it is right now. So thank you very much for, for, for you know staying on this late on a Friday or this early if you're on the other side of the Atlantic, of course. True, true. Somebody says in the chat that obviously this format would help uh, join uh, because otherwise it would have been based somewhere here in the UK perhaps and, uh, and it's much easier to, to reach out.
which is also something that we're very grateful for.